Uh, we are going to be continuing our study in John today. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 13, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 17. Uh, this is a big chunk uh, of the word here for us. We've been going much slower than this, um, but it's one narrative. And uh, so we're going to pick up this account of Jesus watch, washing uh, the feet of his disciples. Now, in the life of Jesus, we are very, very close to the end. Uh, we have um, seen Jesus' birth, not in the book of John, of course, but in Matthew and Luke, we have those accounts. Uh, we don't know much about Jesus' life from his birth up until uh, he's about 30. There's some glimpses here and there of what happens. Uh, but the last three years, he has been in a public ministry, uh, performing miracles, healing people, feeding people, teaching uh, all over the place, preaching the good news that he is the Messiah, the one Savior of the world. And now, uh, in chapter 13 here, we spoke last week at the end of chapter 12 about um, Jesus, this last cry, this last message that you should repent and believe in him, that you would not remain in darkness, and that you would receive salvation. Uh, but there's a transition uh, into John chapter 13, and Jesus moves into the upper room with his disciples. So he is no longer in a, a broad context. Uh, he is with these 12 men, um, maybe some others surrounding uh, in the periphery, but primarily these 12 men uh, in this upper room. And uh, he begins with this very solemn act of washing their feet. So we're going to look at uh, some kind of three major sections, these transition points in the chapter uh, today. Verses 1 through 3, we're going to see kind of the setup and what's going on. And then verses 4 through 11, Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. And verses 12 through 17, uh, we see Jesus give instruction based on his foot washing. Uh, so verses 1 through 3 provide this setup here. Uh, we will read the entire 17 verses and then start digging in a little more deeply here. If you would, and you're able, please stand with me as we read John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to him, to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? For you call me Lord and or teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this example of Christ. I pray that we would learn from it well today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So we have this transition to the upper room, and some debate is wrapped up in all of this because uh, the synoptic gospels seem to have a different timeline than John here by a day. Now, uh, the synoptic gospels have uh, Jesus coming up with the disciples to the upper room and having the Passover feast there. 
John sets it where the, this feast is the night before and Jesus becomes the great Passover lamb that is sacrificed on Friday. Uh, keep that in mind here. This is the day before the death of Christ. So thinking about you, we talked last week, your last public words, right? This week is Christ gathering those closest to him and conveying uh, what he wants them to know immediately before his death. So the reason for this variance between the Synoptic Gospels and John is actually accounted for by an age-old debate that doesn't seem to be a debate for us anymore. But into the even 1700s, you had a debate whether a day went from midnight from to midnight or from noon to noon. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees actually had the exact same debate. The Pharisees would have had way more influence up in Galilee, where Jesus and his disciples were from, while the Sadducees had primary influence over the go- religious goings-on in Jerusalem and the temple in particular. So that accounts for this here, the way it fleshes out. You have this uh, group of Sadducees when they're in Jerusalem. This would have been the Passover meal the night before. Uh, and then the Pharisees would have celebrated it the next day. So Jesus is poses the Passover lamb and the calendar of the Pharisees. The Passover meal occurs during the, uh, uh, the account of the Sadducees or the perspective of the Sadducees time-wise in the Synoptic Gospels. So those that uh, say, oh, the Bible is inconsistent, I don't think that has to be the case at all here. Um, it's widely known that these were debated. And again, up until the 1700s, even in maritime situations in particular, time went from noon to noon rather than from midnight to midnight. Um, so that's why there's some difference here if you've heard that debate. But that's not important to uh, what we're discussing here as far as the account specifically. So before the Feast of the Passover, so this is the, the day before Passover, is the, the Feast of the Passover is the next day, and Jesus is sacrificed as the final, permanent, ultimate Passover lamb that takes away the sins of the world. So uh, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So it tells us that Jesus knows that his hour has come. Now this word, no, it's gnosis, this is a, a deep knowledge. It's something that Jesus is very familiar with. And It's because he and the Father have had this plan from the beginning of time. There was never a moment in all of time that Jesus didn't know that this hour was coming. And and this is important for us because he is going to sacrifice greatly. But John here in these first three verses, he's narrating for us and he gives us some kind of inside information as to why Jesus would have confidence in going to the cross. So he's always known that this hour was coming. He's known that this time was upon him. And it's time for him to do what? He knows he's going to die, but he's going to depart out of this world and go to the Father. Jesus knows his ultimate destination. This is defined even more for us. In chapter 3, it says, Jesus, knowing the Father, had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God. So Jesus is aware of what his future is. He has great confidence in what's happening. He's confident of his destiny. And it says that he knew that his hour was come. He was going to depart and go to the Father. And how was he going to do that? Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. This becomes significant. And what was the mindset of Jesus as he goes to the cross? We know that the cross is an excruciating death. It's the word excruciating comes from the idea of the cross. That's where we get that word. It's excruciating because it's extremely painful. You are physically nailed to a cross. You are beaten beforehand and you suffocate to death in shame naked in front of huge crowds. It's a horrid death. It's not a good way to go at all. But Jesus wasn't even primarily concerned about his death on the cross Many believers were crucified after Jesus. And we have accounts of some of these men going to their deaths with great joy, knowing that they were giving up their lives for the cause of Jesus Christ. And our Savior did not sweat great drops of blood because he was afraid of some physical pain. He was torn and he was just absolutely lamenting what was in front of him because he knew the wrath of God would be poured out on him. 
but he knows this is coming. And with that wrath of God being poured out, that separation from the goodness of the Father, the God turning his back on his Son, Jesus goes through all of that, loving those that were his in the world. And it says he loved them to the very end. Now, this brings up who are his own that were in the world. Well, it's those that would trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Those that God in eternity past had chosen and foreordained that they would be his. It says in John 10 that my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they follow me, right? Uh, or John is speaking. He says they know him and follow him. And, or, sorry, that's Jesus and the good shepherd. Um, but Jesus is saying he is the good shepherd and those that are his know his voice and they do follow after him. But he loved his own that were in the world, that is the elect. And those are the ones that he loved to the very end. So Jesus is, he knows what's coming. He knows the destiny that's out in front of him. He knows that he's going to go through this because he loves them. And then we get this little glimpse of what happens during this supper period. In verse 2, it says that during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose. So we have all these qualifying conditions in which Jesus rose, right? That's the beginning. We're going to talk about seven different uh, actions that Jesus takes when he goes to wash the disciples' feet. But this is all preparation here. We know that he has loved them. And then during the supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. Now, Satan and Judas are both absolutely cap culpable here. They both had it in their minds to betray Christ. And Satan does wish to make himself more than God, right? That's been the battle from the very beginning. He wanted to get Jesus because he knows that Jesus is God. And if I can kill God, then I'm going to win. And Judas, he's always been concerned about earthly things, right? He was the one that kept the the money bag for the disciples. And John gives us insight that Judas has been taking from it the whole time for himself. So uh, Judas is concerned about earthly things. He complains that there's money spent anointing Jesus that could have been spelt, spent elsewhere. And his entire vision, his entire view is that Jesus would come and set up an earthly kingdom and then reign from there. And he would have special privilege because he was one of the inner few. Now, with that dream shattered, he's seen it over and over that he's not coming to establish this kingdom. He's, he says that he's coming to give us new hearts. And so Judas gets frustrated and he is chosen to betray Christ. Um, much like uh, God hardening Pharaoh's heart in uh, Exodus, we see Pharaoh culpable and then God hardening his heart. Here we see Judas culpable, but Satan putting into the heart of God this idea that he would, uh, that Judas would betray Christ. I say in the heart of God, that Satan was putting into the heart of Judas uh, this desire to betray Jesus Christ. So John gives us that little footnote there, and we see in this whole setup that this is before the Passover, Jesus becomes the Passover lamb. Jesus carries the love of his people to the cross, and Judas is present, who has, is going to betray, as Satan has put into Judas' heart that he would betray Christ. All of this happens as Jesus goes to wash their feet. And Jesus knew that God had given all things into his hand in verse 3. It, he knows that everything that's going to happen is intentional. That it's been planned from the beginning. Acts 2 tells us that God used wicked men to crucify Christ. That he would accomplish his, uh, his goals. His plan to redeem his people. So Jesus knows his destiny entirely. He knows that everything falls under his hands. The act that's about to follow, both the foot washing and the sacrifice on the cross, are done in the confidence in Christ of what is to come. He knows the cross is ahead, but he knows what lies after the cross. And that's why he does it. So what does he do? Well, again, we're going to look at seven specific actions here. Uh, they're listed out in uh, the following verses, beginning in verse 4. It says that he rose from supper. Now, we don't do meals like Jesus and the disciples were doing a meal on this day. There was a, a, 
a U-shaped table. Jesus is at the head of this table, and the disciples sit around it. Uh, they are not in chairs. They're reclining at table. They're leaning back. And so you can imagine if we're all leaning back, uh, your feet are near other people, and that's gross. Um, I don't want any of your feet near me. Feet are kind of gross. I'm not like weird about it, but no one's excited about feet, I don't think. Uh, and so these men walk in sandals, right? They don't have enclosed shoes. They walk around in sandals, and your feet get filthy. Uh, at our house, we live on 40 acres out east, and we have shoes that we wear around the property and shoes that we wear elsewhere because there's lots of dirt, and there's sand, and there's animals, and so you get dirty. Uh, these men's feet would have been pretty gross because they walked on dirt streets uh, in sandals. They would have, you know, they're not likely stepping in piles of manure intentionally, but it's around. And uh, feet were not a great thing uh, to have near your face while you're eating in that day. So someone was supposed to wash their feet. And, and there's a setup here that we're going to see in a moment that it was even anticipated in every meal that someone would wash the feet. But that was not a very pleasant job. So it was most often left to a servant. And Jesus' disciples should have been engaged in being ready to wash each other's feet or to for one of them to say, hey, I will serve the rest and I'm going to go wash the feet because there's one basin of water, there's one towel. Um, this is how it should have been. But none of them do that, and so Jesus gets up to do it instead. Uh, let's turn for just a moment over to Luke chapter 22. Just one book to your left in your Bible there. This is the same dinner that Luke's writing about here. And in verse 24 of chapter 22, it says, A dispute also rose among them, as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. So the disciples are arguing over who is best. Now, Jesus, as we're going to see, is rising as a, the leader, the teacher, the Lord, and taking a position of a servant. And this is an object lesson for his disciples. So hopefully, this argument about who is the greatest isn't happening after Jesus has get, gotten up and as a servant washed their feet. Uh, it's likely that they go and they go into this upper room and they're all sitting down or all reclined at table and no one has gotten up to wash everyone's feet. And so Jesus himself gets up to do the job. This isn't the order in which things should go. The disciples are arguing over who's greatest because like Judas, though not to the degree of Judas, and Judas is included in this, they are concerned about an earthly kingdom. They're concerned about their position. They're concerned over who is going to be the greatest. Verse 24 says, A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. They're arguing over who's best. You could see the basin of water and the towel sitting there taunting them all, saying, one of you should be getting up to, to use me, right? This is when my wife and I are uh, sitting down watching something on TV after the kids have gone to bed at night in our sunroom, and the dog gets up and scratches at the door. You just kind of look at each other. You're like, well, who's going to get it? <laughs> the, the basin of water sits there as the dog scratching at the door, and no one wants to get up. And uh, it's normally me because she's covered in a blanket, and I never am, so it's less complicated. But sometimes I do look and say, hey, uh, which, who's doing it? Uh, but this... This debate's going on, and Jesus gets up when he should not be the one to get up to go and, and wash their feet. And he's seated, seated at the head of the table. So this is an awkward moment already when Jesus is the one that gets up first. So he, he rises, in verse 4, he rose from supper, and then he laid aside his outer garments. Well, now the condemnation on the disciples comes even further because Jesus is taking off you know if we had to move a bunch of tables after this I'm going to lose my jacket and probably my tie to go and move these tables you don't wear certain clothing when you're prepared to go and do some work so Jesus takes off his outer garment 
and he lays it aside. And he's preparing himself for the work. Philippians 2 says that he took on the form of a servant, and here he's really taking on the form of a servant, removing his garment. And then he takes a towel. So he, he picks up the towel, and he ties it around his waist. You know, I worked at uh, Cracker Barrel when I was in undergrad waiting tables. Uh, and there were, th- the general managers at Cracker Barrel tend to dress very nice. They're not normally in a jacket, but they're always in a shirt and tie. Uh, at least back then, the guys looked pretty polished. And some of our managers were great, and some were, were not so great. Uh, we had one manager named Max that was my favorite guy to work with. He was stern, but you always knew a tight ship was going to be run when Max was there and stuff was going to happen like it should. Now, our general manager would stand at the front. I hope he's not listening. And he would stand in the server's alley and yell back at the kitchen when they were behind and, and tell them what they needed to do. Now, Max would go back, and over his shirt and tie, he'd put on an apron and get to work and get the kitchen moving faster. Max, though he was the leader and the one that was running everything in the store at that time, he was our assistant general manager, Max would throw on the apron and get to work. That's kind of what Jesus does here when he ties the towel around his waist. He's, he's preparing himself for the work, and the condemnation on these disciples increases even more. And there's this weight that they all know that they should be the ones that are washing everyone else's feet. And now maybe they're sitting there, we know Judas in particular, but these, men's were, these men were sitting there thinking, oh, you know, Andrew really should have been the one to go and do this. I don't know who they viewed as the lowest of the disciples, but there's always a low man on the totem pole, right? Maybe they're still thinking that, but the condemnation just heaps up more and more. So he takes this towel and he ties it around his waist. He puts on that apron. He's prepared to go do the work. And he pours the water in the basin. And this is where we see that foot washing was expected, right? The they, they go into the house that's not theirs. They're meeting in this upper room. And the host, though there's no servant provided, they have provided a towel and a pitcher of water and a basin for foot washing to occur. If this wasn't expected, Jesus would have had to go find a basin and take it and go and draw water to come back and wash the disciples' feet. It was common in this day that this would have been provided. So the condemnation heaps up even more. And then the creator, the almighty, the all-knowing, the God of the universe gets down on his hands and knees with his outer garments taken off and a towel strategically tied around his waist begins to wash the feet of men who think they're too good to wash one another's feet. He sits down with these beings that in comparison to him are lower than ants and he starts to wash their feet. And the condemnation heaps up even more. And if you think feet are gross today, imagine when there's poor nutrition and there's not fingernail clippers. You're like using a knife or something to try and keep your toenails short. And you walk barefoot or in sandals all the time. There's people here who walk barefoot or in sandals all the time, except for at church now. They used to only wear sandals. I haven't examined their feet, but I imagine they're not that pretty because they're exposed all the time. This person knows who they are. I was, I was their youth pastor <coughs> at a previous church, but he doesn't even have a spray nozzle and soap, right? Like when your dog goes and rolls in the mud, you don't really have to get your hands in there. You can just spray them off. Uh, well, he doesn't have that. He has one bowl. And have you ever been somewhere where a bowl is what they use for washing? I, I was in Haiti on, on a missions trip, and there was like 250 kids, and we get one bowl of soapy water to wash everyone's hands. 
And the kid just goes in and sticks her hands in and rubs them around. And after about five kids, that water's black. But you just keep using the water. That's what he's doing with their feet. He takes one person's feet and he submerges them in the bowl and then he rubs them with his hands to get all the dirt off. He doesn't have a scrub brush, right? There's nothing there. He cleans them. And then the only thing we know he has is the basin and the towel and then wipes them. He washes their feet. This is not a dignified job. This is why none of the disciples were ready to jump up and go grab the basin of water and do the work that was there. So Jesus washes their feet, and then he takes the part of the covering on him, the towel that he's wrapped around him, and he uses that towel that's attached to him to wipe their feet clean, to complete the foot washing. His servant clothing is what he uses to dry the feet of, the, of these men that were too proud to wash each other's feet. Now, as usual, Simon Peter has no idea what's going on. And Peter says to him, you shall never, or I'm sorry, I'm up in verse 6, Lord, do you wash my feet? Now, Jesus has moved sequentially through the disciples. We don't know where Peter is in the line, but he's moved up to Peter, so we know that he's washed someone else's feet beforehand. And he's saying, Lord, you should not wash my feet. You are our leader. You shouldn't be the one. And, and that we could understand, right? And Jesus answers, but he says, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. So Jesus gives them, gives them an explanation. He's in essence saying, this is an object lesson for you, and we're going to talk about it. Just let me wash your feet. But Peter still doesn't get what's going on. And in pride, he says, you shall never wash my feet. Now, that seems, again, like maybe a noble thing to say. Right? You are above me. You are my master, my teacher. You're not going to wash my feet. But Jesus just told him, I'm doing this for something you don't understand. So let me wash your feet. And Peter says, no. Can, can you imagine looking at God and just telling him no? But I tell you what, believer, we do this all the time. We talked in Sunday school a bit about pragmatism, that we do what's most practical rather than what the word declares. God has said in his word how we should conduct our lives, and we say, no, nah, I know better. I'm going to do it this way, Lord. You don't understand. Well, I think that, you know, throwing more into my 401k this month is going to benefit me more than giving sacrificially to your church. And we say, I know better what to do. Or we say, ah, you know, I know this person in the church, they're, they, they've been in sin and I, I haven't called them out on it, but I want to just maintain relationships and, and keep the peace. And God says that we are to confront one another on our sins. And so we say that we know better than the Lord what we should do. Or the Lord says that we should discipline our children, and if we don't, we don't love them, we hate them. But it's really easier when we just kind of let things slide. And I don't want to deal with spanking the kid again today. It's been a long day of spankings. We can just let this one go. And yet, the Lord has said that the rod of correction will drive rebellion far from the heart of our children. So we, in essence, look at God and tell him no. And Peter, in his pride, does that here. This is not a humble statement. This is not something that we should admire. Jesus says, I'm going to do it. Just hang on. And Peter says, not just no, but you will never wash my feet. And so Jesus' response is pretty strong. He says, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. 
Now, we're going to get to this fleshed out a little bit in a minute, but there's levels of washing that Jesus is talking about here. We see later that he says that not all of you are clean. So he's saying you're clean, but your feet are this extra degree of washing. So we're going to come back to that. Just keep that in mind as we go back to it. Or uh, that we're going to get to back to that later, sorry. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So then Peter hears this strong rebuke saying that if you don't let me do this, you have no part in me. And, and Peter says, as he is apt to do, uh, to be extravagant and to go overboard, and he says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. This is the disciples a few hundred feet from shore in a boat, and Peter sees Jesus and throws off his clothes and jumps in the water to swim. And the rest of the disciples are like, we're almost there. Like, and they sail around and come and sit down with Jesus. Um, Lord, then not just my feet, but my hands and my head, the things that do action, the thing that thinks uh, all of me, Lord, wash this. So then Jesus continues this explanation. And he says, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet but it's completely clean and you are clean, but not every one of you. Now, does Jesus mean that Philip didn't take a bath? No. He relates this here, as we find out at the, in uh, verse 11, John tells us he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. Jesus takes this servant example and moves it into the eternal. He says, you're saved. I have regenerated you, but not all of you. And we know Judas is left out as the one that is not a true follower of Christ. But then if that salvation, if we have this picture of uh, the, the completely clean person outside of their feet, why would Jesus say, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me? Well, P Jesus is saying Peter, you have a new heart. You're saved. You're, you're clean. But there's a regular renewal that happens. There's a, a cleansing of your feet. And I have to come along and cleanse your feet that you would have a share with me. This is a word picture that the Lord gives us for what happens in the believer's life. You are regularly sanctified. You come to Christ. You confess your sins. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as a believer, you come to Jesus for a regular washing, right? You're going to heaven. That's not what's in question. Judas was the one that was in question here on whether or not he would go to heaven. But Jesus still washed his feet. But you can be saved, but you still have to come back to Christ for this renewal and this, this cleansing of your sin at, a, at an action kind of level. It's not what is eternal here. It's the Jesus cleansing you of your sin, restoring that relationship with him. What Jesus says here, and he, when he says, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me, it's that if that sanctifying, returning, cleansing kind of process doesn't happen in your life, you don't have a share with Jesus. He will sanctify those whom he has saved. And so Jesus sets up this word picture and he relates it to salvation, but then he's going to go and explain this example. So he says, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. So Peter, don't worry about your hands. Don't worry about your head. I'm washing your feet. I'm doing this cleansing, sanctifying ritual here such that you would uh, have relationship with me. And then he says, you are clean, but not every one of you. And that gets back to why John stuck verse 2 in there. Because it seems kind of out of place. Because he talks about the confidence that Jesus has in the Father. And then in verse 3, he repeats the confidence that Jesus has in the Father and where he's come from and where he's going to. But verse 2 is just kind of stuck in there. Because John wants us to know here, and Jesus explains it uh, in verse 10, that not everyone there is a follower of his. So Jesus gets down or gets up from his place, 
grabs the towel, ties it around his waist, pours the water in the basin, gets on his hands and knees, washes the feet of someone that Satan had put into this guy's heart to kill him. He even washed Judas's feet. Now, Jesus indicates here that this foot washing is not sufficient for Judas because he was not completely clean. But this is the example that Christ sets for us to serve others. Now, this word picture of salvation is there, but he also says, this is how you serve. And we know that because of verse 12. He finishes washing all their feet. And you can see him get up and he takes the filthy basin of water now back over and he sets it to the side. He hangs up the towel again. He puts his outer garments back on and he takes his place again at the head of the table. He says, do you understand what I have done to you? These men were arguing over who was the greatest. These men were jockeying for position. And these are the founders of the church. These men largely comprise the Jerusalem council, right, that even Paul submits his authority to as part of the church. Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. Now, you and I, when we look to serve other people, we can have humility that's proper because we're wicked like everybody else. We all need Jesus just like everybody else. But Jesus says, no, you're right. I am your Lord. I am your teacher. I I deserve a place of honor. I sit at the head of the table and I instruct you for a reason. You're right in this. If I then, in verse 14, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, this brings up a question we're going to get to at the end on whether or not foot washing should be practiced today. But just hang on. We're going to get there. I've done this low, disgusting humiliating task. I've gone to each of you as you're reclining, waiting to eat, and I've washed the filth from your feet so that those around you can enjoy their meal. And if I've done this, why wouldn't any of you do it? And none of the disciples at this point can hold their head high. They've watched their Savior get up from his position of honor and lay aside his garments, and tie a towel around his waist, and pour the water, and wash their feet, and then dry their feet with what was covering him. There's no one left that can speak a word as to their position anymore. You see the wisdom of Christ in that? The wisdom of God? As these men sit around back in Luke 22, and they're arguing over who's greatest, And all Jesus does is get up and wash their feet. You should done just as I have done to you. Folks, Christ came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. If you or I think we deserve any better, we are incredibly mistaken. Because if our Savior would wash the feet of the man that betrayed him, we ought to be willing to do whatever is asked of us. To serve anyone that's in front of us. Verse 15, For I have given you an example. This is why we don't wash each other's feet here. Because this is an example that is aimed at servanthood. There are churches that do practice foot washing as a sacrament, as an ordinance. We believe there are two ordinances given to the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism, you do once in your life after you come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Lord's Supper, we take uh, however churches that do it every week, that's fine. There's churches that do it once a year. I was in a church that did that. It was really impactful that one time a year, but I wish it was like every week. Um, But Jesus just says, as often as you do it, we take this. And uh, Jesus is about to... um, exemplify that for us in the 
um, the, the taking of the Lord's Supper here, and it's cataloged more thoroughly back in Luke. But these two ordinances are all that we practice because Jesus says here that this is an example. He is demonstrating selfless servanthood. He exemplifies loving service to those around him. Those that are lower than him, we could certainly say those that are better than us, he had no one better than him to serve. But I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And then he says, truly, truly, in verse 16, he's saying, guys, this is really important. Think about this. A servant is not greater than his master, the messenger greater than the one who sent him. You are not better than Jesus. That's what he's saying here. If he was willing to do this, we should be willing to serve. And if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And I saw a quote uh, from a musician named Matt Merker this week. Uh, Matt Merker is the one that wrote, uh, He Will Hold Me Fast. That's a favorite hymn of many people here. Uh, but he said, if you want a church with community, get ready to let people call you out on your sin. Drive old ladies to church. Bring folks baby meals. Teach Sunday school. Pray for the body. Have long conversations with awkward people. And celebrate weddings and kids while waiting for your own. And right, that's not a, an all-inclusive statement of what happens in the body of Christ. But we should be willing to serve others. Right? If someone needs a ride somewhere, Jesus washed feet. Right? If, if the church needs clean, and I am so thankful for the people here that clean this church week in and week out. Because unless I show up while they're here, I never know who's doing it. But people show up every week and the floors are vacuumed and the trash is empty and the bathrooms are cleaned. And I'm so thankful for you that do that. That's an incredible ministry. I love that there are those that maybe don't serve in the public eye so much. They're not teachers. They're not leading stuff, whatever. But they're willing to come along quietly and serve the church. And that's beautiful. And that's what we look at. You go clean these bathrooms here. You're washing the feet of your church, essentially, right? You're doing uh, a low task for the benefit of the church. But we should serve one another, believer. This can look like teaching. It can look like cleaning. It can look like watching someone's kid. It can look like bringing a meal. Love the people that are around you. And this is believer and unbeliever alike. Because Jesus washed Judas' feet. Now the primary context in which we typically serve is within the local church. That's why God gave it to us. It's a huge blessing of being in the church that we can serve those that are in the church. But we should be willing servants. You know, these awkward social moments when you're waiting to see who's going to grab the check or who's going to go take out the trash or whatever, these shouldn't be an issue for Christians. What should the disciples have done? They should have been bumping into each other on the way to the water basin. But they wouldn't. And even if we're not arguing amongst ourselves who is the greatest, we should be willing to go and serve and demonstrate that we're willing to not be called the greatest. You know, Pastor Tim over at Mesa Hills Bible Church is a great example of this. I don't remember, I was there for uh, associate pastor for almost six years, and I don't know if I remember a single potluck or meal that we did at the church where he wasn't one of the first ones in the kitchen washing dishes. I know every Wednesday night in the summer that uh, summer evening fellowship that we did, he was always the first one in there washing dishes. Because though he was our senior pastor, he was the teacher of the church, he had a servant's heart. And he would go and care for others in this way. Jesus is our ultimate example in that. And he says in verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Blessing comes with serving the body of Christ. Blessing comes with pouring out your lives to other people. Christians aren't supposed to be selfish. We're not supposed to try and gain things for ourselves. We're not supposed to try and have the most comfortable life that we can. We're to pour out our lives because that's what our Savior did. This example of Jesus sitting down and, and washing the, the feet of the disciples has stood out in the minds of Christians for a couple millennia now. 
because it's such a significant task of service. But even this pales in comparison to Jesus going to die on the cross. And maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But Jesus came and he lived this perfect life and he was an example uh, of this servant. And yet we're going to see in coming weeks, a lot of weeks, because John spends a lot of time in what Jesus says in the upper room. But we're going to talk about how Jesus went to the cross and he gave his life and he died and the wrath of God was poured out on him instead of on us because we're all sinners. Right? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, we find in Romans 3. There's no one that's without sin. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Every one of us is a sinner. You've all done something wrong. I've all done, or I've done a lot of things wrong. And because of that sin, we have to be under the wrath of God for all eternity. But Jesus died and took that wrath that if you'd confess your sins, believe in him, turn from your sins and turn to God, he will cleanse you of your sins and he will save you. And your eternity can be with him in heaven, enjoying the goodness of God, instead of eternity under the wrath of God in hell. So the liberal Christianity will look at a passage like this and see this as one of the greatest things that Jesus ever did. But as great as this was, it pales in comparison to what he did for us on the cross. Repent of your sins today and turn to him. And believer, be like Jesus. Serve other people. Don't think that you're too good. Don't think that you should hoard up time or energy or things for yourself. Pour them out for the sake of others. Because if your Savior did it, you should. Because a servant is not greater than his master or a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus here doesn't specify the blessing of God. But the blessing of God is peace and joy. It's resting in him, enjoying him, finding satisfaction in who he is, and knowing that one day, when you get to heaven, that you'll have crowns to put at the feet of Christ. Uh, Queen Elizabeth passed this week. And I saw a quote online. Um, she, one of her uh, private ministers was talking about when the Lord returns. And she says, oh, I cannot wait for him to return. And I hope it's during my lifetime. And she was almost trembling as she said it. And the minister asked, well, why do you care so much that it's in your lifetime? And she says, because I want to take my crown and lay it at Jesus' feet. D to our knowledge, and her uh, Christmas messages were the main place we saw it in public, but to our knowledge, Queen Elizabeth was a strong believer. Um, her children have not proved to, her children and grandchildren have not proved to be so, uh, but Queen Elizabeth did. And she wants to take her, the crown of England and cast it at the feet of Jesus. Uh, and we should want to serve others well that we would have crowns to throw at the feet of Jesus because he's worthy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are worthy. We thank you for this example of our Savior that he would so diligently and humbly serve those that did not deserve to be served. Lord, let us not be like the disciples arguing over who is greatest or even our, in our own minds, vaunting ourselves up above others. But instead, Lord, let us be a people that are willing to go and to humble ourselves and to love and serve those around us, even those that we would not consider worthy of that service. Lord, I cannot imagine the mind of Jesus as he washes the feet of Judas. But Lord, apart from the Holy Spirit and his intervention in our lives, every one of us stands as treasonous rebels against you. Lord, we don't love you or your word unless you act on our hearts. And we're thankful that you have done so. Lord, if there's people here that don't know you today, I pray that you would begin to act on their hearts now and they would turn to this humble, beautiful servant of a Savior and repent of their sins and believe. And for us believers, Lord, let us live lives of service knowing that the servant is not greater than his master. 
Lord, Jesus is the greatest man to ever live. Let us serve as he did. It's in his name we pray. Amen.